I greet you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, the Redeemer, Prince of Peace, healer of our brokenness, and hope of the world. Whether you like it or not, here I am. <laughs> One correction I need to make was that I was elected in 2004. I'm not that old yet. <laughs> but with that kind of introduction, I'm wondering whether I should preach or not. I don't want to taint my image that presented <laughs> by that introduction. Thank you for your gracious words of introduction. Appreciate it. A life in Christ together on a journey of faith. God's people of the Susquehanna Annual Conference, that's who we are. We worship and serve the living God as God's people. There is no other way to be but alive. Jesus Christ is the son of the living God. There is no other way to be a disciple of Jesus Christ but alive. The church is the living body of Christ. There is no other way to be a church but alive. We would like to have each and every one of our churches of the Susquehanna Annual Conference to be a church alive as a vital congregation in the most exciting, vibrant, blissful, and fulfilling way. Whatever the size of the congregation or wherever it may be, it must be a vital congregation if it is alive in radical hospitality in inspiring worship, in life-changing ministry, in community-transforming mission, in courageous witness, in joyful fellowship, in winsome evangelism, in fruitful disciple-making, in growing faith development, and in extravagant generosity of giving ourselves and our resources to God for the redemption of the world. As Apostle Paul says, anyone in Christ is a new creation. Another way to say it is, anyone who is in Christ is alive. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He also said, I came to give you life, an abundant life. My interpretation, there is no other way to be in Jesus but alive. So, Squire and your conference, we are a church alive in Christ together. Recently, Bishop Irons visited with me in my office. What a blessing, blessing it is for me to have my former bishop around and enjoy a time of fellowship from time to time. During his visit, I heard him quoting the words of Leonard Sweet, one Christian is no Christian. And he added, one pastor is no pastor. Those statements deeply resonated with me. As a connectional church, one church is no church. Each and every church of the Susquehanna and your conference is a part of a connection that is larger than itself, so that together we can build up the body of Christ stronger for the sake of the mission of the church to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Together, we are on a journey of faith. No one has arrived, no church has arrived. As God's people, we are all on a journey of faith. I would like to assure you that the journey of faith we are on together is a worthy journey. Let me share with you why in three points. First, those who went before us testify that it is a worthy journey. Their testimony is compelling. Our forefathers and foremothers of faith left behind so many evidences of the worthiness of their faith journey, passion for sharing and spreading the gospel, commitment to discipleship, dedication to the mission of the church, and sacrificial giving of themselves to the ministry of Jesus Christ. They spoke 
loud and clear, in words and in actions, that the journey was worth the world to them. The legacy of their journey of faith reminds me of a passage in 1 Thessalonians. We always thank God for all of you, mentioning you in our prayers. We continually remember before our God, the Father, your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. In the journey of God's people, faith, love, and hope must be present. But let's be reminded that faith and work are present together. Love and labor are present together. And hope and endurance are present together. As Apostle Paul goes on to say to the church of Thessalonica, for we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that God has chosen you. Because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, with deep conviction. Heinrich Heine, a German poet, once visited cathedral in Paris with his friend. They were overwhelmed by the grandeur of the church. They could build a cathedral like this, but we no longer can build something like this anymore. Why, his friend asked. Heinrich answered, they could do it because they had convictions, but we moderns have only opinions. Out of their deep conviction of the gospel of Jesus Christ, of God's love, and of the redeeming power of the Holy Spirit, those who went before us demonstrated that the faith journey was worth the world to them by placing their relationship with God at the center of their lives and by making the mission and ministry of the church their top priority. When I visit our churches in many different places, I give thanks to God for the many heartwarming testimonies that those who went before us have left behind. Among them are the awesome sanctuaries that they built. In those places, I often find myself repeating this prayer, O oh God, make us worthy of our past. We know that the building should not define the ministry. Rather, the ministry should define the building. We also know that the church is not a building, but the church is people. But what they built is their statement that they gave their best to God for the glory of God. It is one of my compelling, it is one of uh, the many compelling testimonies to what the journey of faith meant to them. If Jesus meant so much to them, why not to us? It's the same Jesus. It's the same gospel. We worship and serve the same God whom they worshiped and served. God's people of the Susquehanna Annual Conference, those who went before us, left us a compelling and convincing testimony that the journey we are on is a worthy journey. Let our journey today be worthy of the journey of our forefathers and foremothers. Let the church say amen. amen. Second, God's presence with us makes the journey of faith worthy. God doesn't promise an easy journey, but God's presence with God's people throughout the journey is guaranteed. Once an Old Testament scholar was asked this question, what one word would you say is the most important one in the Old Testament? What one word would tell us what the Old Testament is all about? His answer was, remember. Remember what God has done for God's people. That's what the story of the Old Testament is all about. Another way of saying the same is, remember how God was with God's people throughout their journey. The Old Testament is a reminder of God's presence with God's people. Remember how I brought you out of Egypt. Remember how I made you able to cross the Red Sea. Remember that I was with you in your wilderness journey, in your battle, in your moving into the promised land. Remember, remember, remember. 
when Joshua and his people faced the most critical moment in their journey, what they needed more than anything else was God's presence. And they had it. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. The message was, remember how I was with you all along. God's presence with Israel made all the difference in their journey. Let's remember the promise from the risen Christ to his followers, surely I am with you, always to the very end of the age. Some of you may remember that there was a news article some years ago that claimed the tomb of Jesus had been found. Do you remember that? They said that it was the custom of people living in Palestine in Jesus' time to collect the bones of a family and store them in one place. They said they identified the bones as the family of Jesus because of the names attached to one group of bones like Joseph, Mary, Jesus, and James. Soon after that news article appeared, I saw a cartoon in Newsweek magazine, I believe, which said that the bones found were indeed the bones of Jesus. The decisive clue for the confirmation was that they found a bracelet next to the bones which had these letters on it, WWID. <laughs> what would I do? Let you remember that the risen Christ is here with us today. The God who raised Jesus from the dead is with us on our journey. We are like Joshua and his people. There are many Jordan rivers to cross. The task before us has never been this challenging. Sometimes we feel like Paul when he said, we are, we have a hard press on every side, perplexed, persecuted, struck down. But let you remember we are not alone. God is with us. Indeed, we've come this far by faith, and we've come this far by grace. Amen? Amen. These words are known as the last utterance that John Wesley made on his deathbed. Best of all, God is with us. It's like saying, because of God's presence with me, the journey was worth giving my life for. I had the best journey I could ask for. A journey with God is a life lived best. It's a worthy journey. As our life is worth the living just because he lives, our journey is worth the taking just because God is with us. Let the church say amen. amen. Third, we are on a worthy journey because it's about the transformation of the world. When Jesus taught his disciples the Lord's prayer, thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And when the risen Christ gave his disciples the great commission, therefore go and make disciples of all nations. And when he said his last known words on earth, you will receive power. When the Holy Spirit comes on you, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, he had the vision of the reign of God in his mind. Our journey of faith is not about us. It's about more than our church. It's about the kingdom of God. It's about the new heaven and the new earth. It's about the transformation of the world. It's about God's future for all peoples on earth in and through God's people. Our journey of faith is really about God's journey, isn't it? It is God who invites us to be on God's journey, the greatest journey of all. Recently, I heard the message of Bishop Peter Weber gave at the baccalaureate service of Boston University. He challenged the audience to dream dreams again by quoting the words from a novel titled The Uprooted, written by Elie Wiesel. 
The central character of the novel utters these words as he reflects on humanity in facing the challenge of being uprooted, a challenge similar to what the author himself had to face as a Holocaust survivor. We, as humans, are restless and mysterious shadows of a dream, God's dream. I want to dream my eyes with my eyes open. And Bishop Weaver added, a dream without deeds is a simply a daydream. Deeds without a dream is a sleepwalk. The journey is about God's dream for the world. What does the reign of God look like? What does the world look like when God's kingdom comes and when God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven? Our journey invites God's people to expand a holy imagination for a new world. Let me share a humor that I found in a church newsletter under the head heading, God Enjoys a Good Laugh. So it's a humor. When I say laugh, you laugh. There were three good arguments that Jesus was Italian. <laughs> he talked with his hands. He had wine with his meals. He used olive oil. <laughs> but then there were three equally good arguments that Jesus was a Californian. He never cut his hair. He walked around barefoot all the time. He started a new religion. But then there were three equally good arguments that Jesus was an American Indian. He was at peace with nature. He ate a lot of fish. He talked about the great spirit. But then there were three equally good arguments that Jesus was Irish. He never got married. He was always telling stories. And he loved the green pastures. But the most compelling evidence of all, three proofs that Jesus was a woman. One, he fed the crowd at a moment's notice when there was virtually no food. <laughs> he kept trying to get a message across to a bunch of men who just didn't get it. And when, even when he was dead, he had to get up because there was still work to do. <laughs> now, Susquan and your conference laugh. <laughs> Jesus may be many different things to many different people, but we find this argument compelling that Jesus is the one who dreamt God's dream with his eyes wide open and give, gave his life for it. His journey was about the reign of God on earth as it is in heaven. The reality of the brokenness of this world is so deep. Our eyes must be wide open when the plight of those who make up almost half of the world's population live on one or two dollars a day. Our eyes must be wide open when extreme poverty and killer diseases continue to claim lives by the millions, mostly innocent children and women. Our eyes must be wide open when war, conflict, and violence continue to threaten peace in so many places with far too many innocent lives caught in the middle and are lost needlessly and unjustly. Our eyes must be wide open when the sins of racism, tribalism, sexism, ageism, classism, and all kinds of isms alienate God's children from one another. God's people of the Susquehanna and your conference, it's a time to dream dreams again with our eyes wide open. Here we are, about to embark on a new journey together over the next these four years for such a time as this. For such a time as this. 
this phrase, an expression of a desperate plea on behalf of the fate of God's people in the book of Esther, evokes a sense of urgency and demands a response. Some people would respond, not for me. It's not my time. But some others would respond, this is the time, and we are the people. God's people of the Susquehanna Annual Conference, we are called to be alive in Christ together on a journey of faith for such a time as this. God's people, is this the time? Are we the people? I know that we are facing many challenges, but I also know that the Church of Jesus Christ is God's best plan for our broken world. And I know that we are the best opportunities that God has for the transformation of the world. So we envision the future of our journey with hope. For our hope lies in the God who calls us to be a church. Someone said, hope is hearing the tune of the song of a brighter tomorrow. Faith is singing the tune today. I will keep singing the tune with you to show the world a Savior who is the Prince of Peace, heal of our brokenness, and hope of the world. I'm reminded of the words from Augustine, the Bishop of Hippo. For you, I'm a bishop. But with you, I'm a fellow Christian. I will walk the walk with you. I will run the race with you. And I will dream the dreams with you. It is my prayer that our journey of faith will prove to be a worthy journey. By the grace of God, it will. All to the glory of God. Thanks be to God for you. God bless you. Amen.